Hello, fellow foodies. This is Dr. Quave coming to you with Foodie Pharmacology, your favorite food podcast for the science curious or the science podcast with food curious, either way. Um, today, we have a, a really cool um, topic to cover. You may have heard the saying that you are what you eat, and you may have noticed that sometimes your skin appears a bit different depending on what you're taking in the diet. And so um, I guess about a month or two ago, I was at this conference. It was the Integrative Dermatology Conference. And at this meeting, I met a really lovely clinical nutritionist who's working with adults who've really been failed by conventional forms of medicine in their battle against chronic skin and gut challenges. So our guest today is Jennifer Fugo. She has a master's degree in human nutrition from the University of Bridgeport and is a licensed dietitian, nutritionist, and certified nutrition specialist. Um, she has experience in working with conditions including eczema, psoriasis, rosacea, dandruff, and hives, and has clientele ranging from just regular folks to celebrities and even professional athletes. Um, her work has been featured on the Dr. Oz Show, Reuters, Yahoo, CNN, and many, many podcasts and summits. And I'm just thrilled to have you on the show today, Jennifer, to tell us a little bit more about these connections between our gut and our skin health. And yeah, just to learn a little bit more about your practice and how you, um, how you manage these types of chronic skin conditions in adults. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's start with this, just this basics behind the connection. Um, how is the food that we eat? How does that affect our skin? Well, I would say in one regard, there's a lot of nutrients in food that our skin needs in order to thrive and build correctly from the inside out, right? We don't, a lot of people don't realize that skin is not something that just appears. It is something that is built internally and slowly moves outward. That's why we shed skin and skin cells in time, those dead cells. Um, and the skin is a very nutrient hungry organ. Um, I would argue though, that part of what makes it so nutrient hungry is that it requires so many other organ systems to be operating optimally. And those also require a lot of nutrients as well. And so when we eat a diet that is very limited, and that may be because of a chronic condition, um, inflammatory bowel disease, some sort of gut issue, uh, could be because you've eliminated a lot of foods because you know, a lot of people are very influenced these days to do elimination diets and to layer elimination diet on top mm -hmm. of elimination diet. Um, or you're just not eating a very nutrient dense diet at all, which for many is a problem, is a challenge. Um, and so by no means am I suggesting it with all of this that like there's no room for indulge indulgences and... <laughs> you know, chocolate or any of that. I'm not saying that, but I do think that we have to, um, we have to be cautious when we buy into do diet dogma out there. There's a lot of it these days um, where we think one diet is the way to do, to be the healthiest, to live the healthiest. The reality is we need a variety of nutrients. We all come from a variety of different we all have different genetics. We have different health issues. We've had different toxic exposures. And so the skin is reflective to some degree of all of this. And um, I, I really love figuring out under the surface what's going on that causes these issues to show up. And then part of it is incorporating in the right type of foods for that individual based on a variety of different factors. And then also using herbs in my practice as well to help with things, especially if they're not comfortable doing say like antibiotics or, um, you know, people to a certain degree, like there's a lot of fear of certain things. Um, and maybe they have an imbalance internally that wouldn't necessarily need medication, but can be supported through the, the amazing power of herbs. So that's great. Well, I love herbs, as you know, so I'd love to hear more about how you incorporate herbs into, um, this practice, I guess, um, one place I'm sorry, Rob, my, my computer like did a little thing. So can you make a mark and I'll, I'll restart that with I Love Herbs? It made a background noise. Um, so just for annotation set 311. 
I'm sorry, Jennifer. Okay. So as you know, I love herbs <laughs> and I'd love to hear more about how you integrate these into kind of a, a dietary plan to deal with some of these chronic conditions. So I know, for example, when it comes to diseases like eczema or psoriasis, these kind of chronic inflammatory diseases, um, patients may be given like topical steroids. Does, 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 can dietary changes preclude that? Can you get away with not having to use so many topicals just through diet modification? Or does it sometimes take a little bit of a, a dual approach? I would probably argue, depending on the severity, usually a dual approach may be necessary to try to manage symptoms while you're on the journey. Yeah, that's <laughs> because good. I like health as a journey. That's a good It's point. a journey. And, and, you know, I, the wells didn't run dry in a day, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't expect to just eat really healthy one day and be like, oh, I have all the vitamin A that I could ever need. You know, I mean, it just doesn't work that way. Your body takes time to rebalance. And there can be a variety of factors that when you're, uh, you know, you're, I'm sure maybe your audience is somewhat familiar with the homeostasis, like that balance that the body is used mm -hmm. to. Well, the balance, the body is specific, specifically the microbiome is really used to being imbalanced. It's not just going to flip back because you start to take a probiotic or you start doing fermented foods. So mm -hmm. we want to evaluate each person, also considering what are some underlying issues that may be more predominant depending on what condition they have. Like for example, with eczema, you can have a, a more histamine, over, what I call histamine overload. Some people call mm -hmm. it histamine intolerance, but actually have some feelings on that type of scenario. I, I think it's beyond really an intolerance. Um, whereas you have other people that could have an allergy, really big allergy piece, but I think we have put too much weight on eczema being directly caused by allergies per se. Some people have allergies. I've had plenty of clients who've had extensive allergy panels and have no allergies, but they still have <laughs> horrific eczema. And so um, one of the things that I really try to do is encourage clients based on their blood labs. So what nutrients do you need that are really missing okay. in the blood labs? Um, looking at their microbiome of their stool and seeing what the balance is there of commensal organisms. Are things overgrown? Mm -hmm. Are there organisms there that may maybe shouldn't really be there and are more inflammatory and could cause a problem? Are there certain issues going on within the GI tract that prevent proper functioning from happening? Um, and then also possibly considering organic acids, which gets a little bit more nerdy into the biochemistry of things. Um, but ultimately my goal is to get someone from usually by the time somebody gets to me and I wish they wouldn't wait that long, but a lot of times it does is they are in a really restrictive diet. They've been on it for a long time. They don't know how to get off of it because they feel like they flare every single time they try to reintroduce something. And they're not sure whether it's due to the stress of trying to reintroduce or it's the food itself. Um, and I want to get them to a much broader, more diverse diet because diversity really is crucial for the gut microbiome and yeah. obviously for nutrients. Um, so with eczema, I, you know, especially you, it's funny, you mentioned topical steroids. So steroids, and I don't know if your listeners know this, um, topical steroids can impact the hypothalamus, uh, pituitary adrenal axis the HPA axis and cause HPA axis dysfunction to a point where, because hydrocortisone is man-made cortisol. And so when you slather yourself with that for years, this has not happened to everyone, but some individuals will find that with time, their rashes will get worse. It will spread all over their body to places mm -hmm. they never had them before. And they end up in a situation which is currently being described, though it's not an official diagnosis yet, but it's topical steroid withdrawal syndrome. And so in that particular instance, there are some herbs that can be helpful, things like cordyceps. Um, can be helpful to help kind of regulate that adrenal pattern of cortisol release. And we want to have a nice burst of cortisol in the morning that slowly slopes down. Um, and then also licorice root, believe it or not. I know that w most people who are familiar with gut issues might be familiar with DGL, um, which has the active ingredient removed, which is in licorice. And some people get nervous with licorice because it can elevate blood pressure and it's not appropriate for everyone. But licorice can actually take the deactivated 
cortisol, which is called cortisone in your body. So the, what your body has made, and it impacts the enzyme that converts it back into your body's own cortisol. So it can help to correct with time very slowly that pattern. Mm -hmm. Um, so herbs can be really important. Um, you know, like looking at things for like histamine intolerance or when someone has chronic hives, they may be really helped by quercetin, bioflavonoids, nettles. Um, and then other issues like uh, milk thistle can be really helpful for those with psoriasis because there's a huge liver impact for those, like a great risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, liver fibrosis, and other metabolic issues. Um, I, I mean, I just absolutely love recommending teas. You and I talked about using teas on the Healthy Skin Show, um, and I think teas can be wonderful. Um, and depending on what someone has going on, you know, whether it's using a tea to calm down, like passion flower tea to help someone wind down at night, um, or valerian root, um, mm -hmm. or even as I said, I mean, it, sometimes it's about getting that energy in the morning and caffeine may not be a good fit for that person. So what can we add in maybe like ashwagandha or something like that to help some of those adaptogenic herbs to really help regulate um, the immune system? Um, with psoriasis, I will say ashwagandha is a nightshade. And so some people may find it not to be helpful, whereas others may do just fine with it. But yeah, I love to play around with different plant foods and herbs and try to support people to find a sense of balance and normalcy. It just, it takes time. I'm not going to lie. It's not an overnight process. Herbs can be a really great part of the journey. Well, that's, that's a really great point. I, I think that I love this concept of health as a journey and you're right. The, you know, it takes time for these things to work and it, and it takes, you know, adapting your body to them. I, I want to back up for a second, just to sure. talk a little bit more about the diagnostics. So let's, let's dive in a little bit deeper, you know, with food and pharmacology, our audience is composed of, you know, everyday people to, you know, pharmacology graduate students and professors. And so we have a very wide range and I know I'm, I have my like, you know, student hat on right now. And I'm thinking they're going to wonder like, what vitamins are you looking for in these blood panels? You, you know, we see like when it comes to the, the fecal sample, um, analysis, you're really looking for a balance in that microbiome. But what about the blood? What are some of the, the common kind of vitamin deficiencies that you might see um, in this, in, in your, in your clientele? Yeah. Um, one thing I will say is that each panel may look slightly different, obviously, because it's based on an assessment. Um, I think it's important to consider what someone's blood panels have looked like for at least the last two to three years, because that can give you clues to mm -hmm. things that have been chronically wrong. So, you know, you can have someone who, and we have a lot of people in this country who are walking around appearing and feeling, they say healthy, but yeah, I mean, health is, a, a, it's a, <laughs> there's a spectrum of health, right? Yeah. In the United States. So a lot of people say they're healthy, but when you look at their blood panels, if they ever get them run, they're deficient in a lot of things. So we can't go by how someone claims to feel. And so sometimes it's nice to be able to see that data historically, not to necessarily assume because you never want to assume if you're, especially when you're doing therapeutic dosing of nutrients. Mm -hmm. You don't want to assume someone has a vitamin D deficiency. You don't want to assume someone has like a B12 deficiency. What if they don't? They can present as such, but that could be another factor to consider. Mm -hmm. So um, we also want to consider a variety of circumstances like the person's diet, obviously. So someone who eats plant-based, there's some red flags right there. Zinc, iron, B12, just as a, a, a three, very quick off the top of my head. That I, often I ended up being B12 deficient because I thought I was being extremely healthy. And again, this is someone that understands plant chemistry, but I was like eating lots of vegetables, was moving into less and less meat. And I saw my doctor, she's like, you are super B12. Like you've got to get those levels up or we're going to shots. I'm like, no, I don't want shots. Let me, let me take no. some supplements. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and, and B12 is really important. I've had some clients where they were like, well, is it really that bad? And I'm like, look, B12 deficiency can cause permanent nerve damage in your extremities. 
And mm -hmm. I have worked with clients who've had this and it is awful because it can't get yeah. any relief, unfortunately. So yes, it is a really big deal aside from how it also impacts um, your red blood cell formation. Cause we do mm -hmm. need B12, folate, B6 is the three Bs that really help us to form that healthy red blood cell that doesn't become megaloblastic or wide. Mm -hmm. um, and that's aside from iron, which is the other mineral that is involved. Um, and then we have people on the carnivore side. So if we go to like complete opposite ends yeah. <laughs> where they're eating no plants at all. Um, one of the, so th this is really important because, and, and I wouldn't, I had no way of learning this, just the pattern that I was seeing in clients who were doing carnivore was that people who came in and did not eat liver were folate deficient because folate is found is, is basically the source of folate for a carnivore diet is liver. So if you don't like liver and like me, you mm -hmm. can't swallow pills. So you're not even taking any desiccated liver pills. Um, you, you're going to, there's a high likelihood you will be folate deficient and folate's mm -hmm. really important too. So, yeah. um, you know, aside from, you can also, uh, you can be deficient in minerals and whatnot. You have to be really careful with electrolytes with carnivores. So, that, I mean, there's, there's pros and cons. And that doesn't even get into the fiber bit. <laughs> you know, fiber is <laughs> another important yeah. part. Um, but those are those are a couple big factors. And so from there, looking at like different symptoms, um, also looking at medications to see if there's any nutrition, nutrient interactions or deficiencies that could be caused. Certain medications can deplete, like statins can deplete CoQ10. So we look at all of this mm -hmm. and say, all right, what's going on? And so most, most of the time I'm looking at a CBC panel because I want to see what your blood, red blood cells look like. Uh, I want to see a really good in-depth liver and kidney panel. So a, met a comprehensive metabolic panel. I love to look at uh, GGT, which is another liver enzyme. Um, and then in terms of nutrients specifically, I really like to see if I, if I could get everything like my wish list yeah. would be vitamin A, vitamin D, B12, folate. Um, I love to look at homocysteine as a, a more functional marker for vitamin B6 because plasma B6 is not that reliable as a marker. So I've had clients where they're, they're, the doctor doesn't know. And I understand my dad was an MD. So he had told me flat out, like I was never trained to look at blood labs like you were. We yeah. just learned very different things. And so I've had doctors that have run um, plasma B6 and be like, oh, you have way too much. But then their homocysteine is elevated. So homocysteine becomes elevated when B6 isn't available because B6 is necessary to help clear homocysteine and pass it down the transsulfuration pathway. Okay. Um, so when you get into like methylation and biochemical pathways, so B6 can help bring homocysteine down. Um, and then looking at, um, I always like to also take a look at a urinalysis and then um, red blood cell values for minerals like zinc, magnesium, possibly selenium as well. Mm -hmm. um, those are probably the, the nutrients that are I would say more reliable in terms of blood labs that I could usually get a doctor to run. Cause I, the reason I say that is, you know, I can't write for blood labs and I really prefer to save someone money so they could put it through their insurance. Yeah. So yeah. that's yeah. why I'm, there are more extensive panels. Um, but I, I, you know, my scope of practice is not as such yeah. where I can ask for those. So. This is something to consider when you're doing an annual checkup, maybe is to see with your primary care physician, can we look at some of these levels? I mean, mm -hmm. one question I have is, you know, listeners might be thinking this is okay. I want to eat all meat. Can I just take a daily vitamin or I want to eat all plants and I just want to take a daily vitamin and that'll fix it all. Can daily vitamins and multivitamin actually address all these problems or, or is there a gap that those leave? I think inevitably there probably will be a gap. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, so I believe that every person has the right to choose how they want to eat. It's really you I, do you. I don't good. necessarily agree with that. Like, I think people should eat a diverse diet that probably is mm -hmm. balanced between meat and plant foods. But what some 
anybody chooses to do is really up to them. And there are some individuals who do thrive on a much different diet than I would probably choose for myself. Um, but that being said, yeah, it, when you are limiting certain key nutrients, or for example, with a more plant-based diet, one of the reasons that, for example, zinc can be a problem is that there are phytates in different foods that mm -hmm. bind to the zinc, preventing it from being appropriately absorbed. Iron is the non-heme form, so it doesn't absorb as well. Um, B12 is just not found in a whole lot of plant foods at a sustainable yeah. uh, level for us as humans. And as much as nutritional yeast is wonderful, um, you know, there are some individuals who have yeast issues, they have yeast allergies, mm -hmm. and may not be able to do a sufficient amount. So I do think that supplementation can play a role. Um, I think where we have to be careful is not considering that it's not just the nutrients. We have to consider every little piece of this. Are we getting a sufficient amount of protein? Are we getting a sufficient amount yeah. of fiber? Um, are we getting a sufficient amount of fats in our diet? And what is the balance of fats that we're getting? And other nutrients like choline and, um, you know, like nobody thinks about choline, but Yet there's this whole thing about we shouldn't eat meat, we shouldn't eat it, and people shouldn't eat eggs because it's bad for your cholesterol. And I'm like, yeah, but choline is really important for your brain. Mm. And they're in eggs. So Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, there there are lots of different aspects to these yeah. foods to be considered. Yeah. Well, one 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 issue I know with the Western diet is the overabundance of sugar. Sugar has been likened to taking, you know, a Brillo pad into your body and just scrubbing and creating all this oxidative stress, right? So I'm wondering, can you tell us anything about the role that sugar has? And also does that contribute to any of these kind of chronic skin flares? Do you recommend that people reduce their sugar intake in your practice? or at least monitor it, be aware of it? Like where does sugar play a place in this? Yeah, sugar can absolutely play a part in things. I mean, I think people, generally speaking, so general population, not people who are more health fo focused and conscious about things. Um, the general population is consuming way too much sugar. I don't think anyone is arguing that. Um, most of my clientele, usually they're afraid that the one slice of chocolate or one little piece of chocolate that okay. they're having, they can't have. And I'm like, no, just please enjoy that piece of chocolate. Yeah. Don't, don't give that up. Like I, I would rather people enjoy food. I believe, so I come from an Italian family. And so when I think of food, I have wonderful memories as a child sitting around a table with my great aunts, my grandparents, my aunts and my uncles and this, my parents and this community of us all eating the same meal. And there is so much stigma around food anymore. Um, food is community. It's nourishment. It's so important. And yet I think sometimes we don't realize that we crowd out the more nutrient dense foods for convenience and for sugar. So a lot of my clients, I'm trying to encourage them to reintroduce healthy foods rather than saying, don't eat this, don't eat that. Yeah. Um, because also disordered eating is an, an a factor that comes up quite frequently in the more health focused communities, whether you realize it or not, because of the language that's used around food, like toxic, uh, yeah. <laughs> bad for you. Uh, and I try to be mindful of that because food that the, how we think about food is equally as important as its impact on us, right. From a nutritional standpoint and whatnot. So in general, yes, I think sugar should be I think we need to cut back on sugar probably quite heavily as a nation. Um, but also for me, when, what I what I think of in terms of sugar intake is lost calories that are more nutrient dense. Um, and then also what that sugar is doing to the microbiome. So yeah. it is really uncommon for people who have chronic skin issues to have extremely messed up dysbiotic gut microbiomes. And while yeast are commensal organisms within the GI tract, and they typically live more commonly in the small intestine than in the large. Um, we have to consider 
the history of the person. So for example, you mentioned earlier about topical steroids. Well, steroid exposure suppresses your immune system and it also increases the risk of fungal issues. And the, I get that some people may argue, well, those are topical. How does that apply to the gut microbiome? But they are absorbed through the skin. There is a systemic Im impact. A lot of these people also have had massive exposures to antibiotics over the course of their life, which also shifts the balance of the microbiome that kills bacteria, not yeast. And yeast are opportunistic. Um, it is extremely common to see fungal overgrowth in cases of eczema. A lot of biologic drugs um, many of them, not all, but many of them impact certain interleukins or cytokines that while they suppress them, those are there to help prevent fungal overgrowth. And so, you know, I have learned a lot of statistics from the Integrative Dermatology Symposium from doctors presenting papers that they're seeing fungal overgrowth internally in psoriasis patients ranging anywhere from like 60 to 70% of the time. Wow. Um, so, and, and I would also argue that like seborrheic dermatitis or dandruff definitely has a fungal component because your body's reacting to malassezia, which is the commensal yeah. organism on the malassezia. skin. Yep. <laughs> um, and then, you know, also chronic hives, yeast can mm -hmm. trigger histamine issues. Um, there also can be a mold exposure component. And when you live in a moldy environment, it is not unfortunately uncommon to end up with fungal overgrowth because you're living in this fungly environment and your body starts to shift to that. So, and I'm not also saying like a little bit of mold, like there are some people that live in like a massive mold yeah. exposure and it's really bad. So obviously everyone has to weigh what, what's going on, but that's, those are factors that I have to weigh as a practitioner and decide like, how do we rebalance this? It's more than just the food itself it's such a bigger piece of the puzzle. And I, I will just say for everyone out there, I do not believe that going, cutting all sugar out of your diet will magically get rid of candida. I have not seen that work clinically. Mm -hmm. When people try and reintroduce sugar, it all comes back. Every symptom comes back. So um, I just, I, I think we have, I think diet is very powerful, but I also think this is where herbs can come in and help us to shift and change mm -hmm. these different issues in a very helpful way long term, more so than just diet alone oftentimes will. Well, that's a great point. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about herbs. You mentioned a few, you mentioned adaptogens like ashwagandha. Um, what are some of the common herbs that you might prescribe for someone that's presenting with, you know, chronic inflammatory skin diseases? Like what, what types of things might you suggest that they incorporate? And sure. many of these, of course, are, these are not prescriptions. These are over the counter right. dietary right. supplements that are available, um, in your grocery store. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, again, it does depend on what's going on. So I want to be very clear for anyone listening, please don't assume this is my recommendation to go out and purchase yeah. these because obviously there's pros and cons. There can be herbal medication interactions. Like mm -hmm. for example, I love to use berberine in my practice, but you really can't take berberine if you're on an, a diabetic medication because your blood sugar can drop too low. Um, so I love berberine. Um, I love playing with different herbs. Like we've really started to use sage tincture quite a bit. Um, it can be, I found it to be helpful with um, fun getting rid of fungal issues. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some interesting research showing that it can be helpful with like dissolving uh, fungal biofilms and whatnot. And we've actually clinically seen it be helpful, but you can't start there. Do not start there. <laughs> um, uh, we also love to use monolaurin, which comes from coconuts. It's uh, lauric acid, which is a derivative of coconut oil. Um, I love using, my goodness, Paldarco. Um, and it's nice because a lot of my clients have allergies. So using single herb formulas, number one, usually is inexpensive because some of these bottles for like 120 capsules is like $9. So it makes it really affordable for people. And plus, if they react to it, they know exactly what they reacted to. Yeah. Instead of like, you know, 20 things in a supplement and it's like, well, what was it? I don't know. Um, and I also, like I said, uh, licorice root, um, rhodiola, um, 
uh, the cordyceps. Um, and I found cordyceps at like 500 milligrams once or twice a day, no later than like mid afternoon can sometimes be really, really helpful for people that struggle with, um, adrenal issues, uh, and, and especially, um, the topical steroid problem, um, that I had talked about earlier. Um, yeah. I, I also really, I'm trying to think what are some of my other, my other favorites. Um, I also like Uva Ursi, um, but used in small, small doses for a very short period of time. Um, obviously making sure that there's no liver issues. The person's not drinking alcohol. They're not taking Tylenol because it can be hard on the liver. And we want to make sure that there's no complications with that. Um, so, I mean, it's just like, I love, I really have come to appreciate plants and different of some of the volatile oils and things like that, that are able to change and shift things. Even um, there's, and I, I don't know the, I can't tell you off the top of my head, the three different um, berries, I think that are in like trifala, which is a Ayurvedic combination, but like that can be really helpful because on one hand it can help someone who is constipated. They can sometimes start to have regular bowel movements, but there, mm -hmm. it does have a slightly antimicrobial impact on the GI tract, and yet it encourages regrowth. On the other hand, of other good commensals, and that's a really other. That's one of the things that I find fascinating about herbs, whereas antibiotics can be really almost to some degree, an indiscriminate killer. I think people think that antibiotics are going to literally kill everything and they, they can't. Like, there's, that's why we have different antibiotics, right? Some bacteria yeah. are impacted, others are not. But herbs are interesting in that they impact certain organisms or maybe certain like gram negative or gram positive organisms, and yet they can foster the growth of healthy commensals and support that, which is really cool and something you don't necessarily see with antibiotics. And obviously you're not going to have that impact of wiping out a huge amount of bacteria and leaving this large vacancy for fungal organisms to take over. So yeah, no, I love that approach. I mean, that's a lot of the stuff that we do in, in the, my research group is looking at herbs that not only act as classic antibiotics, but other herbs that interfere with the way that bacteria signal with one another, interfere with biofilm formation, or with, you know, these different virulence factors that, you know, enable them to compete with other organisms. And by knocking down some of those competitive advantages, you can, you know, perhaps see some shifts in the ecology of, of, of that um, polymicrobial environment. So that's, really exciting. And it's, it's neat to see how these can, you know, help people. And again, a lot of these herbs that you mentioned come from very old traditions. I mean, from, and, and the ones that you were mentioning are from everywhere from Alaska to South America. I mean, these are, these are some really amazing um, ingredients that have had a long history of use. We still need a lot more research on them. Um, and like you said, we've got to you know, be, be cognizant of some of the risks of them, not only is from nature safe? I mean, I like to think of, you know, with, with garlic has really potent antifungal properties, but you know, if you're on a blood thinning medication, it can actually be, cause some problems, right? So you don't yeah. want to take a lot of garlic supplements if, if you're on blood thinners. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool to see this approach, this very integrative approach um, to treating skin disease and, yeah. and helping achieve a, a better journey towards health. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's fun too, because I think my, my approach rather than making people afraid of food, and that's one thing that clients will say, well, the reason I wanted to work with you is because you're not going to ask me to take more things out of my diet. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid to try things, but because I know that you're going to encourage this, I'm willing to to give it a shot. And sometimes it takes people a little bit of time, but a lot of times they will start reintroducing things and realize that um, I have one client, uh, just as an example, she's a nurse in Canada and she had been put on an extremely restrictive diet. I think it was a variation of the IFM or into, um, Institute for Functional Medicine uh, elimination diet. And 
it wasn't working. She had like full body eczema, really bad, extreme discoloration. I mean, her feet were like purple. I've actually shared the image on Instagram because um, my client was like, show people this. Uh, because the reason why is it, they wanted her to do an even more restricted diet because it wasn't working at all. <laughs> and she just realized that she couldn't do it. She could not keep cutting more and more food out of her diet. So she found us and began this journey of reintroducing foods. She was eating everything. I think she even eats a little bit of gluten, which is fine. She tolerates it just fine. She's basically eating like her back to her normal diet again with all of this variety. And her eczema is eons better. And clearing up and like seeing the before and after photos, people are like, oh, what diet did you give her? And I'm like, she's eating everything. Like that, mm -hmm. that's what we wanted her to be well nourished, for her to feel fulfilled from a meal, to be excited about food. I want people to be excited when they walk, work, walk into the grocery store. I want them to be excited by the colors of, you know, the produce style and the diff, you know, like. If you have a farmer that you love and you want to purchase your beef from them or your eggs, like I get really excited when I get to go to the duck farms and get my duck eggs because I get to see the ducks that literally lay the oh. eggs that I eat. You know, those types of things bring you joy, right? And that's just even aside from being able to sit at a table with the people you know and love and be able to share a meal with them rather than feeling contracted and scared and being the odd person out who can't indulge or enjoy anything that's being eaten. Um, I, I want people to stop fearing food I'm not, I'm not by any means suggesting we all run out and go to McDonald's <laughs> by saying that, but I think that we've gotten so into the weeds and trying to find, we can, we can argue all day uh, about good foods versus bad foods when it comes to even just like plant foods. Like there's one woman I read about years ago who ate, I think a pound of bok choy every single day. And because she ate a pound of bok choy every single day, thinking it was going to help her diabetic issues, she ended up in a coma with poor thyroid function. So we can overdo anything. Let's try and find yeah. balance, right? Diversity, balance. balance. I like that. And eat in community. Yeah. I think the social aspect of food shouldn't be neglected either. I like that. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. This has been enlightening and um, just really fascinating work that you do. And, and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And tell us where can um, the audience learn more about your work um, and also check out your Healthy Skin podcast? Yes. So you can find the Healthy Skin Show podcast available on every po podcast platform out there. Um, and then we also host the video version over on YouTube. So if you do a search, you'll easily find it. Um, if you want to read the transcripts because you love to read, we have them at healthyskinshow.com. Every single episode is transcribed. And then I love to hang out on Instagram. So if you're on Instagram or TikTok, but I'm mostly on Instagram, um, you can find me at Jennifer Fugo. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. This has been fun. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. This has been recorded today on Restream. I want to give a big shout out of thanks to our producers, to Rob Cohen and Christine Roth at Co-Conspiracy Entertainment. And thank you to you, our listeners, for hanging in with us for four full seasons of Foodie Pharmacology. This will be our last episode of season four, but we are coming back in 2023 for season five. A huge celebration for that. Um, I'm actually heading um, off the grid to Egypt in just a few days. I'm going to be on camelback exploring plants in the desert. So if you want to follow that adventure, definitely check me out at Wave Ethnobot on Twitter or Instagram, where I'm sure I'll be posting lots of fun photos and updates. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there, and I'll see you next time.